Hey, good morning, Cumberland Fellowship. We are glad you all are joining us from live stream all around Crossville today. It's such a blessing that we can bring this to you and that we can even do this and all together come together and unite this morning for worship and the message from Pastor Sam. We just love you guys so much. We miss you guys, and we know we sort of have to adapt to a new way of life for right now, but that doesn't mean we can't unify together right there in your living rooms and worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords this morning. So just give him a shout of praise this morning right there in your living room. He's worthy this morning no matter what's happening in the world. Na, 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 na. I 
us. Even though the storms rage all around us this morning, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though it seems like we're sinking with all this tragedy and all this sickness and all this disease, we know he's got us hidden in the cleft of the rock this morning. In the shadow of his wings, he holds us in the palm of his hand this morning, guys. So we're going to let our faith arise, and we're going to declare together this morning that he is the king of kings. So I'd encourage you, just lift your hands, close your eyes, sing out loud. Just sing with us this morning.
We know his love never fails us this morning. Again, no matter what's going on, I don't know about you this morning, but I know my God has never failed me. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world this morning. So do you know you literally have greatness living inside of you this morning? We all have greatness in us. And I just pray that his will and his purpose and his plan, even though this world, it doesn't look like it's going the way we thought it would. Again, though we may have to adapt to a new life almost, there's one thing that stays the same, our God. He doesn't change. He says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, church. He will never fail us. So I pray we rise up this morning. I declare that we rise up this morning with new levels of faith. And I bind fear to the pits of hell where it belongs. No fear this morning. We believe in you, Father God. We believe in your greatness. We believe in your purpose. We believe in your plan. We know we serve a great and mighty God this morning. You said, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. We will worship you in spirit and truth this morning. We love you. We bless your name. We know we serve the same God that parted the Red Sea, the same God that rose up from the grave three days later. You're still the same. You're still on the throne. You're still a miracle-working God this morning.
hands of everybody that's watching through live stream. We pray that your presence go through these cameras and let people sense your presence right there in their homes this morning. Sing this with us. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. That's it, declare it with us. You never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. making a way in the desert, making every crooked path straight in our lives. We just worship you this morning, Lord. I want everybody in your homes right now to just declare and sing with me one more time. That is who you are. And just think of what he's done for you. Think of what he's done in your life this morning, how he's made a way when there seemed no way. And declare it. Who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who, that's why I keep singing, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who, you are. That is who one more time.
Till that storm was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death, and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored, and the church of Christ was born. Truth of all shall not yield, shall not fail. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. we can stand on your word. We know we can rely on every promise, on every word in the Bible. We know your word tells us that times like these are coming, that we are near the end times, and we know that we can trust in you, that again, you're holding us. You've got, it's like that old song says, you've got the whole world in your hands this morning. Lord, we know and trust that you have the whole world in your hands this morning. We know that your hand is on everything. And we know that Satan and we know that the enemy can do nothing unless you allow it. We just pray for your will and your plan to be fulfilled on this earth, even if we don't understand it this morning. We will trust you. We will trust you, Lord. Amen. Good morning, coming and fellowship. Welcome to TF. Yeah. Glad to see you. Thank you, Pastor Sam. Thank you, Brother Ed Bell. Uh, I'm sure you're getting on with this right now. And uh, continue on with the work of the Lord. I want to read you a scripture this morning. You know, whatever we face, we get our comfort from the Word of God. And this morning, Paul gives us a word of encouragement from 2 Corinthians. He says, We do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, and listen, whether we realize it or not, whether it's coronavirus, flu, or whatever, the day we were born, we started dying. Okay? And he says, So uh, even though our outer man is decaying, he says, Yet our inner man is renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen, like coronavirus, are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So I just want to encourage you this morning, uh, church, that I believe that the church was raised up for such days as these. Uh, to be a blessing to our community, to be, to be a blessing to, to people all around us. And I want to let you know, 
that, uh, you know, just because we're not meeting in this building, the church goes on. And I want to encourage you this morning, this is a time when we usually do offering. We still do offering. We still give because that's what we do. A lot of different ways to do that. You can do it on the CF app. You can do it uh, on the, on online on the website. Uh, stop by the office this week if you want, and you can drop off your tithes and offerings there. I'll tell you why it's important to do that, because the ministry of the church continues on. Listen, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're still feeding the homeless down at the storehouse. They come to the front door. We've got a table set up there. We're giving them meals to go. We're continuing to do what we can. We're going to be partnering up with uh, Cumberland County EMA, uh, get foods in the hands of people that need it. They can't get out. Um, we have the cart right outside the, the doors here at the, of the terrace, so you can stop by, drop off uh, grocery items. The list is on CF Facebook. You can also drop off those food items uh, down at the office. Uh, if you know of somebody that's shut in that can't get out for whatever reason, let us know. Get us contact information. We'll get food out there to them. We're going to continue on with, the, with the, the mission of the church. Nothing stops. We continue to minister to people. We continue to, to love people. We continue to disciple. We continue to do what the church does. Thank you, Cumberland Fellowship. You're awesome. God bless. Good morning. I'm used to you saying good morning, so if you, if you help, just go ahead and say, hey, good morning, Sam, in your homes. I hear you, right? You're looking good today. So we're glad that you join us. Thanks for welcoming us into your home, and thanks for um, being ready. I understand that on the Facebook it's having a, little, a few little glitches because all the churches in our county are live streaming and their church people are on there. And so just remember, if you're still having a, a glitch problem, I think we posted that on Facebook. You can flip over to our YouTube channel. Um, I understand there's not as many glitches there, and it's running real smooth. So if you take that time to switch over there and follow us, that would be great. Uh, just again, say, hey, we love you, church, and thanks for being the church this morning and in opening your homes and gathering with your family and your friends to praise God and to learn uh, his word and listen to the preaching this morning. So if you, before we start, if you, I encourage you, go ahead and get your Bibles out at home. Go ahead and get, find some pens and some paper. Distribute that around to people sitting in your living room because uh, I would encourage you to follow along in your Bible. I would encourage you to take notes on today's message. Uh, we would love that. I think that today's message is going to be very beneficial for understanding the bigger purpose of what God has called you to do. And so, obviously, we've been on the message series, The Journey. And so we've been traveling down this road of the journey of our faith for eight weeks. We're going to wrap it all up today. Today is the last week of the journey of our faith. Just to recap real fast, we, we understood that we started off uh, this year by talking about the Word. Learning how to understand God's Word, learning how to read the Bible, where we go to find information and how to apply that into our lives is incredibly important. There's, that's something that a lot of people feel inadequate and they don't have confidence about reading God's Word, finding information, and learning how to apply it to our lives. So we, we stopped there on this journey. We learned about studying and reading God's Word. Then we moved on down the road of our journey of our faith a little bit, and we stopped at prayer, understanding the power of prayer, the source of prayer, where the model of prayer came from, how we pray in our lives. That's so important to have a successful, memorable, life-changing journey of faith. Then we moved on from that point, and we went down the road to, to worship, learning how to worship. And what true worship is, it's not just singing four songs, but worship is all encompassing. It, it means everything in our lives from, from praising God with song and our words to understanding the scriptures and learning his word and applying it to our lives and reading the Bible to serving people and to being generous. All these things are a part of worship. Then we move from there to figure out what generosity was about, how we live a life of generosity as the Bible lays it out for us. From generosity, we went, moved on and we moved to a place of fellowship and how important fellowship is in exactly what you're doing this morning is that you're gathering in smaller communities for the Word of God to be shared and to be taught and to be learned. And so today we're wrapping it all together. We're going to put it all in one big lump sum because everything that we've done so far, from reading God's Word, from praying, to worship, to generosity, to fellowship, all of that is put into one big basket called discipleship. What is discipleship? I know that's a term that a lot of people have heard. 
We know it because Jesus called his followers disciples. So we would understand, hey, if you're a follower of Jesus, then is that discipleship? Exactly what is that? I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, misrepresentation of discipleship in the church. The way that we preach about it, the way that we teach about it. My hope is that we get all that settled and straightened out this morning. And I want to take some time to break it down and to lay it out for you. And so let's look at discipleship. My understanding this morning with discipleship and what I want you to understand is my hope is surely, surely you guys sitting there listening this morning are not going to think that your purpose for your life is that God came and he created earth. He breathed life out of clay into a man and he called him Adam. Then he took a rib out of Adam and he made a woman Eve and he blessed them and he increased their number and this, these people grew on earth and God watched over them and he loved them and he guided them. That he, he created a nation of people through Abraham that he became a father of a nation called Israel. That God used this nation to birth a savior. The Jews, and out of the Jews came a Savior named Jesus. Jesus rose, he lived his, his life, he, he, he grew up as a young man to 30, and then he went into ministry and lived a perfect life, and he was wrongly accused and rejected by his own people in his own town. They falsely accused him and, and put him on trial and found him guilty and led him to the cross and crucified him through a, a very torturous death, and he rose from the grave all for what? Why did God orchestrate this incredible story? Is it really, are we tempted to believe that all of that is just for you? Just for me? Are we tempted to believe that our sole purpose in this life is to reach a point of salvation? Is that what we truly believe? We've been taught that. We've been taught that our sole purpose is for salvation and salvation alone. And then once you achieve salvation, once you surrender your life to Jesus, your purpose has been fulfilled. Your purpose has been accomplished in your life. I'm finished. I'm done. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. There is nothing else that I need to do in this life. Satan would love for us to believe that that's our sole purpose. Is just salvation. And you might be even sitting in your living room thinking, okay, now wait a minute, Sam. Are you telling me that salvation isn't the most important thing? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that salvation is key. Salvation is important. Salvation is what Jesus came to give you. But that and that alone is not just your purpose. There's more to your purpose than you receiving salvation. So what is that? What does that mean, Sam? Think about this. I got saved at seven years old. I gave my life to Jesus at seven years old. That was 31 years ago. But guess what? If salvation was my only purpose, then why am I still here? Why does God still need me? Why did I, when I gave my life to Jesus, why didn't God zap me from the earth and say, you've accomplished your purpose, Sam. You've done the only thing that I need you to do. Now you get to be with me in heaven. When you accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you've done that this morning, why are you still here? What's the purpose? If you've already achieved your purpose of salvation, then why are you here? Then that means there's got to be something even bigger, something even more important than just receiving that salvation. What is that? What is the other purpose of why God would still need you here? You know what it is? I've already said it. It wraps up into that one word. From reading your word, from praying, through worship, through generosity, through fellowship. And it's all summed up in one thing that we do called discipleship. That is our purpose. You are meant to leverage your salvation. Which what Jesus has through his undeserved love, through grace and mercy, afforded you. To forgive you of your sins so that you have a relationship with God. Not so that you would end there. So that that would promote and inspire something else to happen with your life. What is that thing that your, your salvation is meant to inspire? Discipleship. That's what it's meant. Let's not even take a biblical definition this morning. Let's first just look at a, the Webster's Dictionary. What is the Webster's Dictionary or any other dictionary that you want to find? What does it say discipleship is? Here's the definition. I'll read it to you. Discipleship. It is one or someone who embraces and, here's the key word, 
Someone who embraces and assists in spreading the teaching of another. So think about the biblical implications. Think about the spiritual implications to each and every person's life this morning. As you're sitting there listening. What are the implications? Let's reread that and put the implications biblically in there. What is discipleship? Discipleship is somebody who embraces what? The teachings. What are the teachings, biblically speaking? The teachings is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It is His life and the salvation that He brings. It says, anyone who embraces and insists, assists in the spreading of the teachings of someone. Who is the someone in that definition? The someone is Jesus. It's the gospel of Jesus. And a discipleship is somebody who believes in, surrenders to, and holds on to the truth of God's word. That believes in the gospel of Jesus. Not just that, but it's someone who embraces that to the point that you desire to assist in spreading those teachings. That's discipleship. Do you desire that this morning? Do you embrace God's word to the point that you have a desire in you to say, I want to assist Pastor Sam. I want to assist the staff of Cumberland Fellowship. I want to assist the, the, the church as a large picture of the church. And do my part in using my salvation and the relationship that God has given me to embrace and assist in spreading the teaching of Jesus. That is discipleship, church. That is what we do. That is what we're called to be. What we're called to do with this life. That's why our purpose is still intact. That's why you're still here. So when we look at this, here's one of the things we say. Like, I don't like where this is going this morning, Sam. I really don't like this because I'm, I'm reading between the lines here. I'm thinking about where you're headed. And I don't like it because you're fixing to disrupt the normal flow of my life. You're fixing to change the status quo. You're fixing to tell me that the way that I've always done something is not the right way to do it. And I'm not for sure that I'm ready to change what I've always done in the way that I've always done it. I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. But I'm telling you what God's Word says this morning. And I'm telling you what He's calling you out to do. Why do I got to change the status quo? All of my life, Sam, I've walked into a building. I've sat in a chair. I've listened to a preacher talk about Jesus. I've helped when they needed help. I gave my money when they asked. And then I go home. Why can't I just do that every week? Why can't the preacher just tell people? Why can't, it, why can't I support the preacher when he embraces the word and assists in spreading the gospel? Why can't I be covered under the umbrella of his teaching and, and accept it as my teaching too? It's not your teaching. None of us get credit for somebody else teaching and spreading the gospel. We get credit when we do it ourselves. You see, it's changing. I was never taught this. I was never modeled this growing up in my life. And I was never shown this in my life. It wasn't until I discovered the Great Commission that God radically began to change my whole concept and understanding of my purpose. That it's not just about salvation. That I'm here for something else. God's still using me. God's still using you. And we look at that, here's what I hear, and here's what people say all the time, especially when we feel the pressure. You even might feel it right now. Sitting and watching this, there's something that might be uneasy in your gut right now, thinking, okay, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know what Sam's exactly trying to push me into here. But I tell you this, Pastor, that I don't have the spiritual gift of teaching. I'm not called to teach people about Jesus. I don't have that spiritual gift in this. And you know what I would tell you? I would say you're wrong. I would say you're wrong. I'm wrong. I mean, I mean, that doesn't sit well, right? Preachers telling me that I'm wrong and what I feel and what I think. Yeah, I think that you're wrong. Why? You know what teaching means? Here's another regular dictionary term for you. To teach. What does to teach mean in the dictionary? Teach simply means to show and to explain to someone how to do something. Now, you're going to tell me that you don't have the giftedness to teach somebody else how to do something. Like you've never done that before. In any other area of your life. You've never taught your child. It would be like me. Samuel never fished before. So you know what I did? 
I taught my son how to fish. Have I ever said, God, I don't have the spiritual giftedness of teaching my son how to fish? No, because I know how. You know why I know how? Because I've done it all my life. I'm confident in my knowledge of fishing. And therefore, since I'm confident in my knowledge of fishing, I'm confident in teaching my son how to do it. My son didn't know how to shoot a basketball or dribble or throw a football. You know what I did? I got him out into the yard and I modeled it with my life and I showed him how to do it. My daughter didn't know how to cook, so my wife got my daughter into the kitchen and showed her how to cook, how to turn the stove on and how to measure things out and how to follow the instructions. My wife's done it all of her life, so she has taught my daughter how to cook. At your work, most of you, almost all of you, are given the responsibility to teach somebody at some point. I remember when I was a teenager, I never drove a car in my life. But you know what my parents made me do? They made me get this little book and started reading about how to drive. And after I started reading this book, How to Drive, you know what my mom and dad did? Then they started to show me how to drive. Then they put me in the car with them and showed me what I needed to do. To the point that they said, now you're ready. Now I want you to change seats and I want you to get behind the driver's wheel. wheel, And I will show you how to drive and I'll tell you what to do as we go along. Guess what? They taught me all my life. You go to work. Your boss says, hey. This is a new employee here. They don't know how to lay tile. They don't know how to put a window in. They don't know how to run this machine. I need you for the next week or two or longer to teach them how to do this. And after you have taught them, after you have discipled them in teaching them the knowledge and showing them how to do it, then they will do it themselves. Every single one of us know how to teach. We do it every day. We've done it all of our lives. But there's two things that stand in the way of us teaching the Bible. You know what it is? Lack of knowledge and confidence. And you're not alone. If that's you this morning, you're not alone. I promise you. There are so many people in that same boat with you this morning. You're, you're already stressing out like, I can't, I can't do this. Yeah, you can. I promise you can. Here's what happens. When you lack knowledge, then that affects your confidence. When you don't have the knowledge, then you don't have the confidence to teach it. But if you have the knowledge, then you have the confidence to teach it. That's why you're confident of teaching someone at work. That's why you're confident of teaching your kid something. Because you have the knowledge, so you, therefore you have the confidence to show them. We want to replicate that in the church. Jesus wants to, he shows us how to replicate that in Scripture. To replicate this knowledge so that we have confidence. That's what he wants. You know, if somebody was to call me and say, hey, Sam... My car's broken, man. I've tried to fix it. And the more I try to fix it, the worse it gets. It's made a mess of it. And I don't really know what to do. I'm at, I'm at the end of my road. I need my car. I can't fix it. I just need somebody to help. How do I fix my broken car? Guess what? I don't know jack squat about cars. I don't have no knowledge about cars. So you know what I would do? And therefore, since I don't have knowledge, I don't have the confidence to tell him how to fix his car. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick up the phone, and I'm going to call a friend of mine. I'm going to say, hey, listen, i got a friend whose car's broken. They've tried to fix it. They've messed it all up. And they're at the end of the rope. They need it. They don't know where else to go, don't know where else to turn. Can you help them? And then let's say my friend says, sure, I'll help them. Tell them to come see me. I'll help them. I'll walk them through it, and I'll help them fix their car. You see... I don't have the knowledge. Now, for me, I would love... Here's something that I would love to do. I would love to just get on my knees one day and just pray, God, I want to be a mechanic. God, I don't want to study it. I don't want to read about it. I just pray by your natural hand of miracles that when I wake up in the morning, I'll just know everything about cars. You know what? You know, if that's not going to happen. Well, you know that that's not going to happen. How about this? Okay, God, I want to be a mechanic, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to every day for a month, I'm going to turn in or tune in for one hour a week to Top Gear or Gas Monkey or whatever those shows are. And I'm going to watch one hour a week of somebody who is a mechanic. And after watching for so long, one hour a week of watching them do it, then I'll know everything there is to do. That's not going to work either. You know that. I know that. That's not how you do it. You see, we have the same problem in church, right? Here's what, we, here's what happens all the time. We have somebody call up, call you. They're your friend, and they say, hey, listen, my life's broken. 
I've tried to fix it in so many different ways, and every time I try to fix it, it keeps getting worse. And I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what else to do. I don't know how to fix it. I'm in a mess. I need Jesus. Can you show me how to fix my life? Can you show me how to overcome this brokenness in my life? What do you do? What is your decision now? What a lot of people do is say, I'm not confident in my knowledge of the Bible. So I'm not confident to tell you how to fix your life. But here's what I will do. Hey, Pastor Sam, i got a friend whose life is broken. And they've messed up stuff in their life. Can they come and talk to you about fixing it? That's fine. Yeah, I would love to talk to them. But I want to change that. What I want to change is I want you to say, you know what? I'll take you on the journey. I've been on the journey. I'm pursuing the knowledge. I have the confidence. Instead of calling someone else to lead you to Jesus, instead of someone else showing you how to live for Christ, let me take you on the journey. Let me help fix, with God's help, your brokenness and the mess that you've made. That is discipleship. And that's what God desires every single one of us to do. And isn't it an incredible opportunity that we have today, church? I mean, think about it. It's not ironic at all. We've been on this journey for eight weeks talking about reading God's Word, about prayer, about worship, about generosity, about fellowship. And here we are, right? Talking about discipleship and in an incredible providential move of God. He's taking something... That is very difficult in our community. And he has propped us up with an incredible opportunity that the very first Sunday that I can remember that it is we've shut our doors not due to weather, that today when we've encouraged you to get into your homes, that today is the day we talk about this. I think it's a God thing. And I think God is showing us something that he wants our church to pour into. That if you're not even a part of our church, I think it's something that he's showing you that individually he wants you to pour into. He wants you to move a little closer to the edge of your seat and say, you know what? I do love Jesus. And he has changed my life. And I do want to embrace and assist in the spreading of the teaching of Jesus. I want to do that. I don't want somebody else to do it for me. You see, when Jesus was crucified on that cross and buried in that tomb and he rose from the grave, Two of the Marys came to the tomb that day to check on Jesus' body and they found that he was not there and the angel had appeared to them and they said, listen girls, Jesus ain't here. He's risen. Go back and tell the disciples. So they had left the tomb and they were going on their way back to share with the disciples and as they were going back to share with the disciples, Jesus met them on the road. He said, hey girls. He said, listen, I want you to go and tell the disciples to meet me on the hillside in Galilee. They know where I'm talking about. We've been there before. Go tell them. So they went and told the disciples. They said, hey, we saw Jesus. He is risen. He has risen from the grave. And he says to meet him on the hillside in Galilee. He's got something to tell you. It's an important message. So the disciples gathered the ones that believed. And they went and they waited on the hillside of Galilee. And Jesus shows up. He's got to tell them something that's really important. You see, back earlier in John chapter 16, verse 7. You can write that down in your notes to go back and look at it. Jesus was speaking to the disciples and he says, listen here, disciples. He says, I'm leaving. It's better. They didn't understand it yet. He said, it's better that I leave and not stay here with you. He said, because when I leave, I'm going to send you the helper. I'm going to send you the presence of the Holy Spirit, the very present And the very power that is going to work through me to perform these miracles, to teach the way that I teach, to love the way that I love, to live the way that I live, to raise me out of the grave and to do that. He says, the same presence and the same power I'm going to place inside of you if I leave. It is better that I leave. Why? I mean, for a long time, that didn't make any sense to me. Why would it? I mean... Why would it be better that Jesus leaves? I mean, his resurrected body. And imagine how many people Jesus could have taught. How many people could have seen the body of the resurrected Savior. Right? Surely Jesus could do more than I could do. But Jesus appears to these disciples on the hillside of Galilee. And he says, listen guys. He said, I'm not sticking around. I'm leaving. I can imagine that disciples were kind of caught off guard like, you just rose from the grave, Jesus. 
Like if you stick around, we'll help you. We'll promote you. We'll be by your side, Jesus. And I feel like Jesus is saying, that's exactly why I'm leaving. You're right. You'll always walk behind me. And you'll always let me do it for you. But it's better that I leave. Because I believe that Jesus understood this. That's why he told him in the very beginning, he says, guys, listen, I'm leaving. It's better. Because as long as I'm around teaching and preaching, you'll always let me do it for you. That's why I'm going to give you the same strength and the same power and the same presence that I depended upon to do the things I do. And I'm going to give that to you. You see what I'm saying? Now, I don't want to leave. (laughs) And I don't want nothing to happen to me as your pastor. But here we are. I would have never seen this coming, would you? I never saw that the pressure would get so great in our community, in our culture, in our, even in our country, that the pressure would cause church doors to close. But here we are. Once in a lifetime, I'm 38 years old, I've never seen this before. Some of you are way older than I am and you've never seen this before. So what's going to happen now? What if this feed is cut? What if we're unable to come to you live streaming? What if you're unable to sit in their home and listen to the preacher speak to you and teach you? What then? Is the gospel message done? Is there no hope of sharing the gospel message anymore? Will we be quiet? Will the doors of our home be closed? Who's going who's to embrace and assist in spreading the gospel message of Jesus? Who's going to do that? Now you're beginning to see why you're still here. Now you're beginning to see how you leverage your salvation to fill the purpose of your calling. Discipleship. God has given us an incredible opportunity in these moments to push in to what He's called us to do. Discipleship. Let me share a few scriptures with you this morning. We're going to look at 1 John. As He's telling us, we have to understand there's God's plan for evangelism. God's plan for evangelism was never to be through one man. That's why Jesus' ministry was only three years. Why so short? That doesn't make sense. Jesus, why didn't you minister for 20 years before you left? Think of how much you could have done if Jesus would have done it for 20 years. I mean, why did Jesus even pick 12 men to, to hang around with? Why would he do that? Is it because he was lonely and he wanted some travel companions to travel with him as he's taught? We know that that's not true. We know that's not why Jesus picked his 12 disciples. Why did he do that? We're about to find out. Throughout Scripture, let's look at what it's, we put these Scriptures together and we understand what is the purpose of having followers. We see it right here. Even John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Look at what he says. You have to take this personal in your life. You have to apply it to your own life this morning. It says, those who say... They live in God. Should live their lives as Jesus did. Circle that last part. If you're following along with me or taking notes at home, take your pen, highlight, circle, underline. Live their lives as Jesus did. We're going to see the connection here throughout the New Testament. So those who say they live in God, those who say they love God and live according to His Word should live their lives in the same pattern and in the same way that Jesus lived His life. Okay, let's see if this theme flows throughout the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul talking. Paul is another author writing another book. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. It says, Paul says, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are His children, live a life filled with love. Here's another place. Underline, circle this next one. Live a life filled with love. How? By following the example of Christ. Okay, John said, live your life as Jesus did. Paul is saying, how do you live out this life? Imitate God. How? By following the example of Christ. Of how Christ lived his life. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice. As a pleasing aroma to God. Where else? Maybe maybe what did Jesus himself say? What was the message Jesus himself gave? In John. The gospel of John chapter 13 verse 13. It says. Jesus is talking. He's speaking. And he says. You call me teacher. 
And you call me Lord. You say that I'm your teacher. And you call me Lord. Meaning you say with your own words that I'm the authority of your life. You take direction from me. You take your marching orders from me. You say that out of your mouth. That I'm your teacher and that I'm your authority. I'm your Lord. He says, and you're right, I am. Because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, your authority and teacher, I have washed your feet and you ought to wash each other's feet. What is Jesus about to say? Underline and circle this. A theme that runs throughout the New Testament. He says, I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. You see it? You see it this morning? The whole thing of be imitators of God. Live as Jesus lived. Follow the example of Jesus Christ. Follow the example that I have given. I've given you example to follow. Do as I have done to you. What is that? That's discipleship. That's embracing and assisting the spreading of the gospel of Jesus. See, Jesus knew, if I don't leave, then I'll always let it be on my shoulders to share the good news. God's plan and strategy of evangelism has always been through replicating. You're taking one person who has received salvation. And when they embrace God's word, they turn around and assist in spreading that gospel to other people. And those people who receive God's word will then embrace it and turn around. And then they too will assist in spreading the gospel of Jesus. That's discipleship, guys. That's what God has called us to. And there is no greater time in my life and probably yours that it's more paramount and needed than this moment. Because I can't be all places. But right now we're meeting in hundreds of homes. You know what that means? It means there's hundreds of opportunities of discipleship to happen right now. That's incredible. You want to talk about the power of multiplication. I'm equipping and teaching and training and inspiring for you to go and disciple. And so we look at these words of Jesus. How can we trust in it? For three years, Jesus was preparing these men for something. For three years. What was it? When Jesus came to them on top of the, the hillside and at Galilee, the first thing that he said was in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. I encourage you to go there. Matthew 28, verse 18. This is the first things that Jesus said. Why would he start out like this? It says, Then Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I've defeated sin. I've defeated death. I have ascended. I will ascend to the right hand of the Father. I have all authority. I am the Lord and master of all. Why would he start out with that? Obviously, he needs the disciples to know that what I'm about to tell you, I have the authority to say and I have the authority to do. I'm in complete control. You've got to listen to me. He's setting it up. Even Philippians tells us the authority that Jesus Christ has that no other person has. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, it says, at the, even Jesus has so much authority that even at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. What kind of authority is that? That every person who's ever existed will recognize the authority of Jesus. This is the man who gave up his very own life to display an unbelievable amount of grace to join you back with God in a relationship with Him, to forgive you of your sins, to save you from death, to grant you eternal life. This is the man that did that. And He's telling you and He's telling me right now that He has the authority to tell us what He's about to say. I mean, think of that. How could we ever say... That Jesus is our authority. 
and yet not do what he said to do. Doesn't make logical sense, right? You see, let me show you what else Jesus, from his own words, tells us. John chapter 14, verse 21 says, Whoever has my commands, whoever's heard me tell them what to do, and then does what I've told them to do, that's the person that loves me. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Whoever knows what I've said in the word and then does what I've said in the word, that's how they demonstrate that they truly love me. It's authority, right? Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teachings. We're fixing to see what Jesus is teaching. My Father will love them and He will come to them and make our home with them. This is the Holy Spirit. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. Anyone who does not love me will not obey the command that I'm about to share. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. He is the one who has given me this authority. Then He said to them, Whoever wants to be my my disciple must deny themselves, must deny their own desires, take up their cross and follow me. Jesus also said to the Jews who had believed in him, he says, if you hold to my teachings and do what I've asked you to do, then you'll prove yourself as my disciple. So my question is, before we get into what I want to wrap up with this morning, my question to you, as you're sitting there this morning, ask yourself this question. Is Jesus my authority? How do I know? Well, do you know what he says? If you know the commands and teachings of Christ and you do them, then you are submitting to him as your authority. If you know the commands and teachings of Jesus and yet do not do them, then that proves you do not allow him to have authority. The only way that Jesus has authority in your life is if you model that by doing what he's asked you to do. Where does that put us? How does that motivate us? What does that mean we have to work on doing? Here's what it means. This is one of the last things that Jesus shared with his disciples before he left. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. He says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, I'm not an English teacher, and some of you that are listening are, or you're really good at English. Obviously, from Wednesday night's live feed, I can't speak sometimes and say wrong words. But I've wrote something out to teach you this morning. So I want you to look at this. When we look, English lesson, all right? So when we look at the English language or any language, we know that we have two things that I want to talk about. We have an imperative verb, and we have things called participles, all right? Now, I had to fresh up on my English to figure out what this was before I taught you. (laughs) So when we look at this, here's the imperative. The imperative verb is the command. The absolute command in the sentence. The participles usually end in I-N-G, which the participles show you how to fulfill the command. Participles show you how to fulfill the imperative verb. So I gave you some examples. As you're looking at home, you follow along with me. They're going to zoom in on this paper right here. I, I put a saying out here to show you. So when we look at this, this statement says, Taking out the trash... Sweeping the floor, wiping down the counter, clean the kitchen. So in home, you go ahead and talk about it. See who's right. Where is the imperative verb in this statement? I'm going to circle it for you. Go. Try to figure it out. Have a discussion. See who's right. You got it? Here we go. The imperative verb, the command in this sentence Is clean. That's the imperative. That's the command. Clean. Clean what? Clean the kitchen. So, let me get another color. What are the participles? This should make it a little easier. And if you miss this one, then bless your heart. (laughs) All right. So, 
participles, end usually in I-N-G. What is the participles? You got it. You're smart. Taking is a participle. Taking what? Taking out the trash. What's the other participle? There's three. You got it. Sweeping is the other participle. One more. What's the other one? Wiping. Clean is the imperative. Clean what? Clean the kitchen. How do I clean the kitchen? By taking out the trash, by sweeping the floor, and wiping down the counters. I'll do one more with you. All right, here's another one. Statement. Tune up the car, changing the oil, checking the plugs, and replacing the distributor cap. Now, what's the imperative verb here? What is the absolute command in this sentence? I'm not going to give you as much time now because you've probably figured it out. The imperative verb is tune. Tune what? Tune up the car. What are the participles? The ing ones, got it? Changing. Changing what? Changing the oil. Checking what? Checking the plugs. What else? Replacing. Replacing. How do I tune up the car? By changing the oil, by checking the plugs, by replacing the distributor cap. That's how. So now let's roll. We got a few more minutes of this. Um, now we're going to the Great Commission. Remember everything that I've said, right, is leading up to this point for you to understand this and get this. Remember what I began the very part, the first part of the message about is that we are not created and put on this earth just for salvation. Yes, that salvation is an incredible gift that God loves you so much that he wants a relationship with you. Then he wants to, re- to, to leverage that relationship to do this. This is why you're here. This is why you still have purpose. This is why you're not gone. This is what God is still calling you to, the Great Commission. This was the thing that He ordered His disciples to the hillside of Galilee to tell Him this. This has got to be important. If this is the thing that He says, go tell my disciples to meet me, I've got something to tell them. He's fixing to say, guys, I'm leaving, but I'm about to give you your marching orders. I'm about to give you your purpose. You got to do this right here. What is this? It's a great commission. We got to do it and we got to understand it. One imperative, three participles. This is going to be a little harder. Okay, here we go. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you to do. This is Jesus. He didn't tell the group. He was telling them individually, each disciple. This is each disciple's command. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. Baptizing and teaching. What is the imperative verb in this sentence? Before I ever knew the Great Commission, I would have told you wrong. You want to know what it is? You ready? You're discussing it in your home. See who's right and who, see who's wrong. Whoever's right, then that means whoever else is in your house has to serve them lunch today and clean up all the lunch mess. Is that the deal? All right, here we go. The imperative verb is right there. Disciple. Some people get it wrong because they think go is the imperative word. It's not. Because we got to remember what we talk about. The Greek. In the Greek, let let me share with you. In the Greek language, it doesn't read the same way. Actually, in the Greek language, it says this. Therefore, as you are going, going, it has an I-N-G. In the Greek Did you know in English we have I-N-G. In the Greek, it's either O-N-T-E-S or E-N-T-E-S at the ending. This has an E-N-T-E-S in it. As you are going, it doesn't, in the Greek it doesn't say make disciples. In the Greek it says, as you are going, disciple all nations. 
So let's read it as the Greek would say it. As you are going, disciple all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. So we know the imperative. What are the participles? Going is one. What's the next one? You got it. Baptizing. What's the last one? Teaching. That is the command. The command is not disciples, disciple. Period. Disciple. That's the command. How did Jesus, from the words of my Savior, my authority, my Lord, my Master, my teacher, what did my teacher tell me to do? He told me to disciple. How? By going, by baptizing, by teaching. What does that mean? Every one of you are going. Where am I going, Sam? Going on a mission trip? No. Where am I going? This word going means as you are going. It is an understanding that you're already going. You're already going every day. Where are you going? You're going to work. You might be going to the store, maybe. In a normal life, we're going to ball games. We're going to movies. We're going to hang out with friends. You're always going. So what is the implication there? He says, as you are going, disciple. What does that mean? As you are going to work, disciple. As you're going to hang out with your friends, disciple. As you're going to the movies, disciple. As you're going out to eat, disciple. Disciple. Embrace. Embrace and insist the spreading of the good news of Jesus. Disciple. As you're going, disciple. What else? I'm already going. You're already going. You've already got that down. Everything that you do, everywhere you go, you're discipling. How else do I disciple? Baptizing. What does that mean, Sam? Baptizing has a greater emphasis right here. He says, you're already going. It's like Philip and the eunuch as Philip was going on the road to wherever he was going. He met a man that was broken and needed Jesus. And so as he was going in his life, wherever he was headed to, he took the time when his life intersected with another person that didn't know Jesus. He stopped in the midst of his going and he taught him about Jesus and he led him to Christ and he walked him down to the river and he baptized him. He enlisted him as a follower of Jesus. He went public with his faith. Baptizing means embracing the gospel. It's a public profession of faith that you are to lead somebody in. As you are going, baptize, meaning to share the gospel, to lead people into a relationship with Jesus. Embrace them and affirm them as a follower of Jesus. What happens after you baptize somebody? That's not just my job. It's your job. We're working in this together. I'm not just a pastor. I'm another person. I'm another follower of Jesus partnering with you in this great commission. Come on, church. Go. Disciple, baptize. After you've enlisted them as a follower, after you've shared your knowledge, after you've poured into them and affirmed them as a follower of Jesus, you don't leave them off to the side. You don't say, see you later. What are you supposed to do after this? You're not done. He says, you, not me, not the preacher, not the pastor. You, you do this. Don't leave them hanging. You teach them. Teach them. Teach them what? The good news of Jesus. Teach them everything you know. Our responsibility in this, guys, is to say, hey, as I'm going, I will disciple. I will affirm and lead them into a relationship with Christ. Then I will take the personal responsibility to teach them everything that Jesus has taught me. Yes. You want to see them move? You want to see God do something incredible? Then you take up the mantle of ministry. Then you take up the responsibility of teaching. Move. And in this, teaching. 
What do I do? You first teach them everything that Jesus taught. You walk them through Scripture. And then you teach them how to obey it in their everyday life. What does that mean? As you are going, you're teaching. It means not only do you sit down and you you read the Word and you explain the Word and you teach the Word with them, then you do life together and you model that teaching in your everyday life. How you live, how you love, how you help, how you interact, how you talk. Teach it in both spectrums. You teach the Word, then you model it through your living. What did Jesus do for three years? He taught the Word and He modeled it with His life. Discipling. He gathered His disciples on Galilee. He says, I got one more thing to tell you before I leave. Disciple, why do you think you were with me for three years? It is better that I leave because when I leave, you'll begin to do this. Because if I stay, you'll be dependent on me to do it for you. I'm gone and I'm going to give you the power. That's what he says. He says, therefore, go. And disciple all nations. That word nation right there is ethnos. You know what that means? It means other nationalities, other people than just you. It means you're supposed to go and baptize and teach other people that are not just like you. This refers, this word nations refers to Gentiles, people that were not like the Jews. He says, I need you to go, and it doesn't matter that they're like you or not like you. Go and teach everyone. And if you'll do this, I'm not going to leave you hanging. You're trusting in your own power. You're trusting in your own understanding. You're trusting in your own knowledge. You're trusting in your own ability. He says, if you will do this, I will be with you to the end of the age. I will be with you wherever you go. And wherever you're going, and wherever you're discipling, wherever you're baptizing, and wherever you're teaching, I will give you the spirit. I'll give you the strength and the wisdom and the knowledge to do what I've asked you to do. Come on, church. Disciple, we want to see God move. This is the model of evangelism and replicating. Will you join in embracing the word? Will you join in assisting me and other churches in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ? He'll make a way. He'll make a way for you this morning. I pray that you're encouraged. I pray that you move. I pray that you begin to believe the Holy Spirit can do what we're saying He can do. I've seen Him. I felt it. I've experienced it in my own life. It's amazing what God can do when you step out with just a little bit of faith. Not understanding, not knowing how you're going to do it. But it's amazing how God rewards that type of faith. Will you have that faith to step? Let us be united in discipling. Just bow your heads. In your homes right now, let's just have a time of prayer. If you just want to gather around the coffee table, your couches, you may want to get up in the middle of your floor and hold hands. You may want to let people pray in your circle. The time is now. And in our time, we've never, there's never been a more opportunistic time than right now to pour into this. Let's pray. Let's bow your heads. God, we just come to you right now. God, we thank you for for your son, Jesus. God, that he stepped into this world. You saw and you recognized our brokenness. Lord, you see our failed attempts to make ourselves right before you. Lord, we don't have the power to win over our sin. We don't have the power to defeat our struggles. And that power and that grace and that mercy only lies within your life, Jesus. And you stepped into this world knowing our brokenness and knowing our unworthiness of your life. But you gave it anyway, Jesus. You're our teacher and our Lord. You come to show us. You've come to pour into us. You've come to show us our purpose. Not only that we bring salvation to our lives, that you that you elevate us and you leverage our salvation to disciple others, Jesus. God, we love you. Thank you for defeating Satan 
on the cross and through the resurrection. He is defeated. Satan has no place. Satan has not won now. He will not win tomorrow. He will not win ever. He is a defeated enemy. Jesus took the victory from his hands when he rose from the grave. He knows he's defeated. And all that he has are these failed attempts that he lofts into our culture like right now. He wants this to rob you of your joy and your faith. But we will not let that happen. We will stand strong in victory in our Savior, professing his name. He is our God. He is the King of all kings, our Savior, our Shepherd. He is the beginning and the end of everything. He is our way maker, church. Pour into him right now. Worship him and lift him up. I encourage you if you're sitting in your homes right now, if God is welling up something inside of you, if there's something you need to release, if there's some burden that you've been carrying, know that he is a way maker, that he has all authority, that his name is above every name, that his name is above your sickness, that his name's above your disease, that his name's above your struggle, his name's above your sin, his name's above your guilt, his name's above your past. He has all authority. His name is above every name, and he is worthy of worshiping him right now where you stand. It doesn't have to be awkward. He is worthy of the praise in your living room. Lift it up as we sing. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of this. You are a way maker. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work. Time. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop. Way Thank you for joining us this morning and showing Satan that his attempts have failed yeah, to hinder the message in the gospel of Jesus. Amen. And he needs reminding each and every day that he will not win. And we have victory on our side yes. through our Savior, Jesus. Jesus. I hope that this morning that you realize that God's Holy Spirit and his ability to move is not isolated into one building. 
when the church is together. That His Holy Spirit and His ability to move can happen anywhere where there's a willingness to allow Him to do so. Thank you for your willingness to allow Him to be present in your life and in your home this evening. We love you, church, or this or today. We love you, church. You're everything to us. We'll continue to minister to you. We'll continue to pour out the message to inspire you to go and do what Christ has called us to do. We love you. Have a great week. See you next Sunday. Adios.